I am so excited to introduce you all to um, our speaker. So we're going to talk about the science of gratitude. And this is James Larkas. Can I just get a bunch of hands, please? So excited. Yes, thank you. So James Larkas has his master's of arts. Um, he's a content manager, great digital health. He's an affiliate uh, faculty member at MSU Denver. Uh, he's a health and wellness coaching program. He has, a, he has a health and wellness coaching program and is the founder and lead positive interventionist at Vigio. Am I pronouncing that correctly, James? Yep. Vigio Wellbeing. So let's please give James a warm welcome again. Thank you so much. And James, please take it away. Yes, thank you so much. It's great to see everyone um, and to see all of your responses. I love that uh, introduction question. And flying was definitely taking the lead in the beginning. And I think invisibility is coming up close at the end. Um, and again, this is the science of gratitude. Um, I think starting out this presentation in gratitude, thanks for doing that, Sandra, for asking people to start and share what they're gr uh, grateful for. Um, and I'll share something I'm grateful for. Um, it is not only a Friday, as Sandra said, um, and it's October. Well, my computer is in Friday mode. So Sandra is going to be actually changing slides for me. So you're going to get that annoying next slide, next slide for me, just because my computer is not working and is on Friday mode already. Um, but I'm grateful for the staff for putting this together and so for bringing me in. And I'm grateful to, to hopefully have a conversation with each of you um, as you think about sort of implementing health and wellness uh, and well-being practices into your work and into your districts. Um, I know that there was a little bit of content or, or context shared about me, but I've been working in education ever since um, I've been out of grad school. So I've been in about seven or eight years working in education, primarily in the higher education space and primarily working about how do we create a culture and an ethos of well-being, um, both for faculty, staff and students. Um, and this is probably one of my favorite topics to, to talk about. So I hope that it resonates with you all as you think about where you're at. Uh, both individually, but also collectively as schools and as districts um, and as schools. So I appreciate you all um, coming today. And if we could go to the next slide, which we're going to go over pretty quickly, just because you all gave me introductions already, which I think you were doing for sort of your um, sort of the attendance purposes. But uh, it's great to see where everyone's coming from. And I appreciate you throwing those in there. And if you haven't, if you can just put your name in your school district in the chat, that'd be great. Um, and then next slide. I know they shared a little bit about sort of the outcomes for this series, but I also wanted to share some outcomes that we hope to sort of cover today. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit of the research behind both the well being movement, but particularly then getting into gratitude. But first, I'm going to get into what I call sort of the mind mishaps. And these are things that I have sort of um, put together, um, I've seen from other stuff and just sort of over the years put together. These are the ways that our brain has been wired. Um, it's natural, but they have been wired to maybe even preclude uh, uh, us from achieving higher senses of well-being. It's just natural patterns, natural ways of being that might get in the way of well-being. But if we can name them, if we can know them, maybe we can do something about it. Uh, I'm gonna focus on one in particular um, that will uh, lead into the idea of gratitude as being a key and core intervention that we can use. So we'll define well-being as a practice. Uh, and then at the end, we'll sort of name and practice some of these uh, and see some of the research behind gratitude and see how it can maybe incorporate into your current experience. All righty. Next slide, please. All right. Oop, one back. Thank you. Um, so First of all, I wanted to um, kind of contextualize this a little bit. So gratitude is obviously um, something probably hopefully each of you have heard of before, um, but I want to put it in the context of a larger well-being movement. Um, so the science of well-being as a field, um, it's been talked about for a while. There's been different constructs, different people who've been talking about how do we uh, kind of answer this question? What does a life well-lived look like? Um, it's sort of the main core question, or how do we live lives of purpose and of wholeness? Um, but the science of well-being has really emerged, I would say, in the last 20 years, which is pretty new as we think of like a discipline. Um, and it really started um, primarily because there was, uh, at the time, the American Psychological Association, or the APA, had a president. Uh, his name was Martin Seligman. And he sort of said, let's try to answer the question that I just posed. What does make a life well-lived? And also put a different way, say, can we potentially learn just as much if we ask what goes right with people 
as much as if we ask the question, what goes wrong with people? At the time when he became president of the American Psychological Association in the mid 90s, about 90% of the research that was coming out was about you know, diagnoses, symptoms, and what was going wrong with the human experience. And we've learned so much about how we can remediate some of those ill things that go in our life, some of the adversities that go in life that are a natural part of life. We've learned so much. What he was trying to pose is not to say that it's better or different, but it's more complementary and additive if we can ask the question, what goes right with people? Can we learn just as much by focusing on some of those sources of virtues, of strength, um, and uh, of capacity building that we could hopefully incorporate not only into living more lives of purpose, but maybe also help us in times of struggle and in times of adversity. So there's been a growing uh, field, growing importance, and I think that's why you're seeing sessions just like this. If we could go to the next slide, please. And the, one of the things I want to sort of put out there um, that I've sort of uh, listened to recently, and I think I've put in some of the resources. I know you get resources from these sessions, so you can check this out afterwards. Um, but I talked about the rise of well-being sessions. Um, the most popular class at Yale um, right now is the science of happiness and the science of well-being which is really fascinating. It's a very, you know, DU is a great academic institution, but Yale's also a really strong academic institution and students are gravitating towards this class called the science of well-being. And the professor, uh, Professor Santos, uh, who gives this course, kind of talks about and has coined this term called the GI Joe fallacy. Now, I didn't really grow up with GI Joe, um, but maybe some of you have, but from what I've been told and what I've now researched is that every episode ends uh, and now you know and knowing is half the battle. Um, and the reason that Santos calls this a fallacy is because our brain, that's actually not true. Uh, knowing things is a critical step. Awareness is a critical step in any sort of process, but knowing is not half the battle. Um, we actually have to make a conscious practice and choice to incorporate certain things in our lives. For instance, I know stretching is good for me. Do I do it all the time? No, knowing is not half the battle. 85% of the battle is sitting down on my yoga mat and doing the stretching. Um, so we, what I'm trying to share with you today is that we're going to be giving you some information and giving you some knowledge, but knowing is not half the battle. We have to think about how can we incorporate that, incorporate this into our practice and into our daily lives. And to kind of show this in a different way, if you click the next slide for me, I want to ask you which of these two tables, the left or the right, and you can either think of it on your own, or you can put it in the chat, which of these is bigger? Which table is bigger, left or right? We've got a right, we've got a same area, we've got right. All right, John, you said same area, you are correct. If I could, if you could click to the next slide, these tables are actually the exact same size, it's just an optical illusion. Um, so this kind of proves that like our brain often naturally goes and we think we know something, um, but it's actually not fully true. Um, so this G.I. Joe fallacy kind of shows up in multiple ways. And this also connects to some of the mind mishaps that I'm going to ch chat about here in a second. So if we can go to the next slide, I'm going to talk about those a little bit. Um, and actually, this is a placeholder. If you could skip over to the next, there's five that I have sort of identified. Um, the first is connected to that table, is that our mind's strongest intuitions are often wrong. Our brains have been wired and primed to make quick decisions that often lead to us being safe or to hopefully uh, optimize our lives, but they can often be wrong. And the example there is that table um, example that I just showed. There's a lot of those optical illusions, but our brain's strongest intuitions are often wrong. The second uh, point here is that we judge ourselves relative to reference points. Again, um, I think back to how a lot of these are connected to like Maslow's hierarchy of needs and the first level being safety, security, and basic human needs. So this comparison piece is really to make sure that we're safe, but we judge ourselves relative to reference points. That comparison piece often gets in the way of our happiness. Um, one of my favorite quotes from Brene Brown is that comparison is the thief of joy. Um, it really gets in the way of us being able to feel whole and to be able to feel happy. And some interesting research that's connected to this is they've done some stuff. We know we had the Olympics and the Paralympics this past summer, uh, and they actually studied the happiness levels of these elite athletes. And they did it primarily for podium winners, first, second, and third. And obviously the people who win first have, you know, sky high, they, they're the best in the world at what they do. 
Um, but what's really fascinating is the differences between second and third. The second place winners have really actually low senses of well-being, even though they are the second best at that thing in the world, especially compared to their third place peers. And a lot of the research behind this is because if you're third, you're happier on the podium. You made it, right? You just got in. Whereas those second um, place winners, the silver medalists, their reference point is first. They're like, I was so close, but I did not get there. So our brain, no matter where we at, uh, we judge ourselves and we compare ourselves in reference to other points. And that can get in the way of our, our happiness and well-being. The next one is the one we're going to be focusing on. Oh, yep. Sorry, I forgot that I did that. You're good, Sandra. Thank you. I forgot I did that order. Uh, so I'm going to give you two other ones and then I'm going to give the one we're focusing on here. Um, the fourth one that I like to talk about is that our minds are programmed to adapt and get used to things. Um, a couple of examples. Um, ever since I've been working from home, I'm in my basement here and I'm sitting right next to, I love my cat, but I'm sitting right next to where he does his business. And I have, when I come down here, um, I can smell what he's been doing, but after a while I get used to it. And if I don't know if you ever walked into a room and you've kind of had that reaction, but that's a, a weird example, but it's our brains really get used to things. Um, we adapt very, very easily. Um, and another uh, maybe more research-based example is that um, they've done some research for people who are working uh, professionals and they give them, you know, they say, if I were to give you a raise, um, let's measure your level of happiness, um, but also what you think you maybe should be getting. And what's interesting is for every dollar that, uh, that you know, they kind of average it out for every dollar that someone gets a raise, there's an expectation that they should be getting a raise of $1.40 to actually feel happy. So even though we're getting a raise, something good, we've already adapted and we already think, okay, this is like my baseline now, I need more. So the goalposts of success often changes. So our minds are programmed to adapt and get used to things very, very quickly, even the good um, things in our lives. And then the next one and last one is we actually don't know that our brains are that good at doing that uh, thing, that we're so good at adapting. Um, so here, um, and I'll use more of a school-based example, they've talked about, um, uh, the research has shown that like particular relation to grades. So for grades, um, there's an overestimation about sort of what we think, how grades will impact our happiness. Um, so if we get a bad grade, it, we think that it's gonna really negatively impact us. Uh, similarly, if we get a high grade, we think it's gonna be super great. I'm gonna be super um, feeling high on top of the mountain. But when they kind of follow up and they do happiness research with them and give them subjective well-being scores, it's actually pretty consistent, no matter if you did well or if you did bad. Um, so it's, it's pretty consistent and we overestimate, we overinflate because our brains get used to it. We often associate certain things getting in the way of our happiness more so than they actually do. So we don't realize how good we are at adapting. But the one I want to spend most time on here is the next one, um, which is right there in the middle, is that our brains are wired to remember the negative. Um, it kind of stinks. I'm going to say it again, our brains are wired to remember the negative. Um, again, I'm going to go point back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs and think about the lower levels uh, of that sort of pyramid and its psychological safety, uh, food, uh, shelter, all those sorts of things that are foundational to our sense of self. Um, because of that, I think our brains are naturally wired to think of where are all the threats around me. Uh, and there are lots of threats. There are lots of things that can get in the way of our well-being, but it's very different now than maybe our predecessors in evolution who were thinking about, is there a bear in this cave that's going to maybe eat me, um, right? It's different, but our brains and our, the way we have evolved has, has continued and our brains remember the negative. And that's where the science I think of gratitude really comes in, if we could go to the next slide. So knowing that that, I put it in the middle, but in some ways I think this might be like the, the first cornerstone of those mind mishaps that I shared. But gratitude is a, a specific technique and strategy and tool that you can hopefully use to sort of combat that first uh, mind mishap. And now what is gratitude? Um, you all shared what gratitude is. Just to give you a couple of quick definitions, um, it's the recognition that there are good things in our lives. There's gifts and benefits that we've experienced or received. Um, it's also the recognition that other people or some external source have helped us experience and receive these gifts and benefits. What stood out to me is that um, 
in your quick little introduction that Sandra put out there, a lot of you, it was a social thing. You talked about your friends, you talked about your family and or it was about sort of experiencing the world around you. So it's that recognition that there are good things, good people, good experiences uh, in your life. We can go to the next slide. Um, so that's a quick definition. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of the, the background of what this the, sort of the research has been starting to say about this, but gratitude it impacts us in sort of three different ways. Uh, it has a physical, a psychological, and sort of a social um, sort of benefit. But I'm gonna start here with the physical. So the physical, um, it's shown that people who are more grateful have improvements in sort of their heart rate variability, which is sort of a field of study that shows sort of our, our stress levels and our ability to be sort of centered and calm um, and impacts blood sugar control, blood pressure. Um, those with gratitude have stronger immune systems, better sleep, uh, more willingness to engage in exercise and other healthy physical related behaviors, um, more willing to seek help for their concerns and have reported better overall physical health on sort of subjective scales. So there's been a lot of research to show that this one little sort of simple exercise can have um, multiplier and interconnected effects to our physical health and our physical well-being. Next slide, please. Similarly, and probably the one that makes most sense, this also has a, a large impact on our psychological health. Those with a, a grateful mindset um, have higher levels of positive emotions, uh, example, happiness, expressing pleasure, joy, more optimism, uh, lower levels of stress, depression, and anxiety. So not only the presence of the positive, but also the decrease of negative things in our lives. There's less, they're less likely to experience burnout. And I'm imagining that one might stick out for all of you working in education, knowing someone who has worked in education, burnout is real. Um, especially generosity burnout is something that um, I would check out some at some point. It's sort of an interesting field of study as well. But those who are um, grateful experience less burnout and they have increased life satisfaction. And then lastly, the social. Um, there's social benefits. Uh, there's often in the research, they talk about gratitude being a social glue. Um, a fun little challenge you can do right now as you're listening to me or you can do at, at the end um, that I like to maybe sometimes even open up, and this is another intervention, is to open up your phone um, and to look into your phones, uh, into your pictures and find a picture that makes you feel grateful. Um, and just take a moment, savor that experience, um, and think about why that is. Um, who was there? What was happening? What were the emotions? What were all the senses that were being used? Um, but this can often be sort of a, a good intervention, but it also reminds us that it can be a social glue. It can connect us uh, amongst people. Uh, and what I've found in a lot of the research that happens in education is that a sense of belonging is usually the number one predictor uh, of student success. Um, so gratitude can really help facilitate those connections and that sense of belonging, both for yourself and hopefully for others. Uh, gratitude inspires people to be more generous, kind. Um, there's sort of this reciprocal altruism, upstream reciprocity, all these things. But um, I do want to go to the next slide to talk a little bit about specific research um, so that we can get to you all to have um, some discussions. Um, so one thing that I wanna share here is like, Okay, you said all these wonderful bullet points, but I wanted to highlight just a few studies that kind of highlight this for you all. Um, and this is a study that was done um, at the University of Virginia, and they asked uh, participants, students, to write for 10 minutes. And they asked them to think about a current ple pleasant experience uh, and to think about, is it ending soon? Um, and if it were either ending soon or it's gonna be far in the distance, um, and would you be happier or would you uh, potentially be more sad? And what they've found is that when you have what they call sort of this temporal scarcity, those who thought, well, this thing is coming to an end, like maybe graduation is happening in a month, um, they were more grateful. It allowed them to take uh, sort of the moment to be able to think, uh, to value what's been happening and to be a little bit more intentional and mindful of what's going on. Um, so you can see here that on these scales, those who thought of it happening sooner rather than later, we're almost one point higher on a uh, 10 point scale um, for subjective well being. So it can have a pretty dramatic effect just by thinking about if things are going to be ending sooner rather than later. It allows us to be more mindful. Um, something that I came across, and I know it's like people are talking about being in the mountains and all those sorts of things. Leaf peeping season is here. Um, and I think the reason people love it so much is the fall changing colors is because it only happens for a very small part, part of time. So there's this sense of connection, there's this sense of mindfulness, there's this sense of being present in the moment 
that I think is why people love it so much. Not only is it beautiful, but it allows us to sort of slow down and be grateful for what we have. Uh, so it's kind of a similar sort of uh, concept. If you go to the next slide, please. The next, um, sometimes people are like, yeah, grateful, gratefulness is good, being gra uh, grateful, blah, blah, blah. But um, maybe it's, you know, it just, it's going to make me complacent. I'm just going to be like, everything's great. I'm not going to achieve. Um, but this is, there's some interesting research that sort of combats that. Um, participants um, in this study were asked to identify sort of six different personal goals uh, that they wanted to pursue. Everything from academic, vocational, relational, health, whatever. But just write down six goals. And then putting into a, a great, a gratitude condition, a control condition, and just like a, you know, uh, just write about something random condition. Um, those who were in the gratitude condition actually made 20% more progress on their goals, even after some follow-up studies like months uh, in the future. So a gratitude, a grateful mind can really actually help us progress on our goals um, as well. Next slide, please. Um, another piece, um, a lot of times people say that gratitude uh, research um, can't really uh, happen unless there are good things happening in our lives. Uh, but it's shown that even when there's suffering, even when there is things that maybe aren't in line with sort of this happiness uh, that people would talk about, um, that they that it has a positive benefit. So um, what they asked participants here to do is to think about maybe what they called an open memory, maybe an open wound, something that has been sort of nagging at you, um, something that maybe isn't as pleasant, something that really gets you down. Um, then they also did the same thing. They put people in a gratitude condition, a control condition, and sort of just a, a general emotional condition. And what they've shown is that there is increases not only um, in overall levels of happiness, but it also sort of closed the book and closed the door on these open or intrusive um, sort of memories and is shown to actually allow people to adapt and be resilient. So gratitude can help people move forward, even in the sense of trauma, or even in the sense of uh, loss or things that are not so good in their lives. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, did you do a couple? Yeah, these are just showing a little bit of what I shared, just the different things, but if you could click to should be some bar graphs there in a second. Thank you very much. Um, the other thing is that we often underestimate how powerful gratitude can be. So they had participants in this study do gratitude letters where they wrote letters and then delivered them to people. Um, and as you can see here, there is um, an overestimation of how awkward it would be and an underestimation of the impact it would have not only for, the, for themselves, but also for the participants that they gave them to. So the, the gratitude letter increased the recipient's overall levels of happiness um, and decreased um, sort of the, or there was a decrease in sort of the, how awkward would this be? So we over, overestimate the anxiousness of doing such thing and putting ourselves out there and we underestimate the impact that gratitude can have. Next slide, please. And as we wrap up, I just wanted to give you a couple, just sort of summary of different interventions you can do. Um, so I talked about temporal scarcity is to really take a moment to think about something pleasant in your life and as if it were to be ending soon and to be thinking about that because it allows you to be more mindful. It allows you to take in all the emotions, take in all the connections that come from it. So temporal scarcity uh, from that Virginia study is, is a particular way that you can think about things in your lives and hopefully express gratitude. There can also be reframing past events. Um, I didn't talk about this one as much, but to think about um, maybe what you've learned, what you've gained from those past experiences. Maybe look back at that phone picture and just think about what did that moment really do to contribute to your sense of who you are now and also who you want to be. Um, so reframing past events as learning growth opportunities and what have you taken? The most powerful one, um, I think, has been gratitude letter, gratitude visit. So writing a letter and uh, either sending it to a person or the big challenge, I would say, is to either... Um, call them, or if you are safe and can, actually delivering it to them and reading it to them in person um, can be a really, really strong uh, intervention. And there's been a lot of research around the importance of gratitude letters. Another way uh, to express gratitude is to do mental subtraction. So to think about something in your life um, as if it weren't there. So if my lovely little cat that I was talking about wasn't here, how would my life be different um, if he wasn't there? Um, so thinking about uh, the addition by subtraction is sort of the mentality here 
and can be a gratitude intervention that you can use even in a really quick setting. And then the last two are really connected to how we open this session, but it's just a simple either counting your blessings, three good things, gratitude journal, all kind of the same thing, but to really take a moment at the end of each day, at the end of each week, and write down the things you're thankful for and grateful for, um, but to also write like how that has sort of impacted your life, how it made you feel. So not just like, I'm grateful for my family, but I'm grateful for my family because blah, 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 blah. And this has brought me blank. So going a little bit deeper than just, I'm grateful for insert thing or experience here, but to think about how it really impacted and connected to the, the different senses and different experiences that you've had. Next slide, please. And just quickly before we sort of wrap up, um, I just wanna share that that gratitude um, has been, made a huge impact not only in my own personal life and really shifting my mindset, but also these are main interventions that I've done with students. Um, I've, I've ran a program where I gave everyone a gratitude journal and we've actually done some research to show that the gratitude journal has really increased students' sense of belonging, sense of trust and sense of autonomy in their experience. Um, so it's been a really powerful tool um, and so much so that it wasn't just for students. I was starting to get faculty and staff saying, hey, can I get one of those gratitude journals that you have, those three good things that you apparently have printed out? Um, so it can be a really powerful tool and I'm hoping that it can help inform um, sort of your experiences in your districts um, and at your schools. But uh, as we move on, remember, knowing is not half the battle. I've given you some information here in a quick amount of time, but knowing is not half the battle. It has to take a conscious, active practice. So I'm hoping my challenge for you all is to think about what can really make sense for you um, personally and for your school. With that, I have just hopefully now you've been able to get some of these things. Um, and I appreciate you all letting me share. And I'm excited to hear how you kind of uh, chat about you in this practice in your breakout rooms. Um, all right, so now back in the big group, I hope that you have some good um, discussions. I'm just gonna go ahead and open it up. We've got James for a while. So if you, grateful for no notes, yes. <laughs> Thank you, James. Um, very timely. <laughs> so if anybody has any questions that you want to pose to the boot group or you want to share any part of your discussion, uh, please go ahead. You can do that on the chat. Um, any brave souls that want to unmute, that's also welcome. Let's do it. Anybody want to start us off? I'm going to say we were just ending our conversation. We had a great conversation, by the way, James, thanks for giving us so much good stuff to talk about in our breakout. Um, we were just ending by having a conversation about what role gratitude plays in creating a culture of well-being. Um, and I'm just curious if people had thoughts on that, maybe either share in the chat or, or James, if you wanted to comment about that, um, or if anybody has things that they want to share, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear what other people share. I know I have my own thoughts and it's obviously culture is a big thing, but I would I'd love to hear what people think and I can share my own experiences thus far. And to add on to that as well, um, Melissa posted earlier really a question, if anyone's gonna uh, add a gratitude practice to their life that you learned about today. So that kind of goes on with what Carla was saying too. See some nodding. You gotta elaborate with the nodding. <laughs> well, what Peggy, were you just about to? Uh, were you just about to share? I was. Oh, thanks, Peggy. Um, Go. The I think our, our man. It was around 2010 when our staff in Monta Vista was trained in um, the Capturing Kids Hearts program from the Flipping Group, and they they created such a good way of sustaining it that it's it's still with us. I mean, I, I'm sure we can always brush up and do it better, but it it includes. Um, beginning every meeting, whether it's, you know, in, with admin or whether it's a classroom um, morning or something like that with saying good things. And it, I just love how that's helped us to get to know each other, how the students, it builds their um, sense of belonging for sure. And it helps teachers know what's going on in their lives, helps everybody learn to listen to each other. 
And yeah, and I was saying too, that as a counselor, I just found it beautiful to be able to end a session with a little kid, whatever they shared, however hard it was. Okay, now let's say three good things. And I think, isn't this true? Maybe James could elaborate that when you say the three good things, you're not talking about things that happened to you, which often is what it comes out like in the that flipping practice, but it's just things that never change. I will, I could make it laugh with one one little boy that said frogs, toads, and then he was thinking he went and angry birds, <laughs> and so that kind of thing. You're like you're ending, you know, just with joy, no matter what else happened. Yeah, I can jump in there. I think ending the day um, with that is is fantastic. I think that's where a lot of research is, and also as you mentioned, starting it. Um, some stuff I didn't talk about and gratitude, I think has a puzzle piece within it, but, um, just all, there's a lot of research on the power of positivity, um, especially at the beginning of things. So I'll, I'll speak from my own experience and my own. So I do, um, individual health and wellness coaching for, for people as sort of a, a side business for myself. And the, um, the thing I always start with is what's been a win today or what's something you're grateful for. And the reason I do that is because, the research says that when you go into the positive mindset, we're more creative, we're more resourceful, we're um, more uh, sort of motivated, but a simple question like that can sort of shift the framing of our brain and allow us to not be as stuck. And a lot of times I think when we talk about our well-being or culture, we feel stuck. And so something like this can hopefully be just a quick little key that you can unlock a little bit of that um, and allows us to be more generative, both individually and collectively. I'm seeing some, um, some things in the chat here. It seems like some of you have tried some of this and it's been a uh, little bit on and off and that's great. And I would say, you know, obviously it's a process, um, but also how can you make this, I think sometimes communal uh, and social can really help both to the culture question, but also maybe to your own, uh, your own ability to make this sustainable. Um, there was a, it's, it's been a while back. I'm not sure if it's still a thing, but the concept is, can still be true. Um, but I remember going on a webinar like this and it was called um, Gratitude Graffiti. Um, and they, what they did is they sort of, uh, you know, sometimes there's like storefronts or whatever on like a main street or um, just in a certain area. And they've all committed that, the, that it would be sort of on their windows. People could write with markers or something that could be easily wiped off, something they're grateful for. But it made it a social and a communal aspect to see the good things that are happening in the community. And I think that there could be ways to maybe incorporate that in a school-based setting. I know for us, um, the, the sort of clinic and practice that I was running, we had a, a chalkboard um, that was sort of painted onto the wall. And it was a what am I grateful for um, that people could do, but it was also kind of like, it kind of morphed into a positivity board of like, leave an encouraging note and take one. So like when you needed one, you could take it from someone and then you just have to leave something encouraging for the next person and sort of became this communal and social aspect that kind of helped um, not only for individuals practice and sustainability, but I think really helped create a positive work uh, and culture environment. I love that idea, James. I'm sorry, I'm going to jump in here just one more time because you're reminding me of something that Andrea has shared with us before. And I'm wondering, Andrea, if you wouldn't mind sharing what happened in one of your schools that you worked in because it's. Yes, and I just pulled it all out. Um, so I was a teacher for 13 years uh, in Texas and the school that I was at for eight years, um, we had something called Thankful Thursdays. And um, all it was, was a little piece of paper that was just printed and said, I am thankful for you because, and on Thursdays, we would walk around before school starts and we would put it on every, uh, teachers, uh, staff members on their chairs so that when they come back to the room, they can see all the things that other people are grateful for that they do. So I just pulled them out. These are all of my grateful things that I've had and I haven't been teaching for four years so I still have them and they're just really great to look at I did include uh the the instructions and even the little grateful slips um in our resources for today so you can print that out and start doing that uh, at your school as well thank you Andrea such a good idea I love that the creativity with it all um, also, 
I want to post James' question out loud. I don't know if James want to ask it. Which one? Um, you were talking about Michelle's idea. Oh yeah, I just I love that Michelle said that she's familiar or something like that, and um, I just kind of me going to my coaching brain. I'm like, what can we make that? Like, what would you need to make that happen? Well, there's this little spot outside our commons area, and I noticed um, before the rain um, that we got last night that there was chalk out there, and people were like drawing stuff, and it was really kind of cool. And I went out for lunch, and I drew a little something something on there. Um, and, uh, I don't know, that would be a really cool spot, um, for everybody. I don't know. Just thinking, just thinking out loud, or I have, you know, dry erase boards that I can like slide over and, you know, like save stuff or hide stuff if I need to. So I don't know, just right. places. Yeah. Common spaces, movable spaces. And I also saw so another theme I'm reading in the chat here is that it doesn't also just have to be grateful, right? Like some people are saying, I think Melissa's saying appreciations. It could be what's a win you've had. It could be grateful, but coming up with some sort of word that allows people to take a moment, pause and think about what they're proud of or, or what they've accomplished or what they're grateful for, or who they're grateful for. All those different ways of doing it can also um, maybe make it fresh. So you're not constantly saying, what are you grateful for? What are you grateful for? What are you grateful for? So I appreciate all those insights that you're all sharing in the chat. Yes, absolutely. Thank you all for being just, this is such an engaging conversation. Really appreciate that. Any other thoughts or anything that may have come up in your groups that really left you thinking or you thought, oh, that's a great idea. Let's consult with James. I want to share something that came up in our group, which was um, just kind of the idea of having someone to go to who you know is very supportive. They might be a mentor or a really positive force in your life, but someone who you know is just going to say, you're doing a great job. You're trying your hardest. You know, um, I'm here for you. Um, and I think that that plays into what was mentioned earlier about the culture of gratitude and the culture of wellness, that the more we can find those people in our lives and also remember to be that person for someone else, like that's part of how we're creating that culture in our workplace. And it can be hard, you know, to remember to be that person when you have your own feelings of overwhelm or whatever's happening that day that's that you're struggling with. But just remembering to say something positive to someone is something that I find super powerful as well. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and one thing I've noticed, and I appreciate kind of pivoting the conversation a little bit is it sounds like a lot of you are thinking about how can I incorporate this like for my school and my community? And I'm, I want to make an assumption that you're saying kind of maybe for your students, but this like for yourselves, like how do you create this for, for staff, for interstaff, for administrator? So you can create kind of that top down and bottom up uh, sort of idea of culture and of appreciation. Um, so I, I appreciate that because it, it's very easy. Um, I know the reason I got into education is because I would say I would quite qualify myself as a giver. I want to give, give, give to people, to give to students, to give to the development of other people. And we have to understand that we have to do that ourselves. And it can be really taxing to do that as well. So thinking about this, and I'm sure all the other sessions you've done uh, are hopefully just tools and a toolkit that you can pull from uh, when you need them. I was just writing in the chat that from what I've learned, folks working in schools have that giver, giver, giver personality, which I'm so glad you guys are here because of that. Do something to yourselves. You know, I can't believe I forgot I used to do this in the classroom, um, but in my, it, well, I guess it was because I can't do it now because my ceilings are too tall, but with my creative writers, um, I used to um, make them come up with 100 reasons to be grateful. And then, um, you know, we'd write them up in nice, creative, flowery language. And then I would, um, you know, put them on like crazy colored paper with crazy font and hang them from the ceiling um, with fishing line. And it like kids would just walk in and like, just it was just awesome. It was great. I need to do that some more. I forgot about hanging them from the ceiling. That was really cool. Anyway, that's just something that I used to do that I'm going to start doing. That's, that's awesome. And to me, uh, it sounds yeah. like that was like a really fun thing. And, um, 
I, I think of not only students, but for us, like the importance of relationship and, and like social capital. And like, it feels like you created a cool, fun social capital. Like, what am I grateful for? And kind of, what are you grateful for? I think the, that's a really fun way to do that. And they're creative ways. It doesn't just have to be lists. If you have more creative, you can have people ask them to draw what they're grateful for a picture mm -hmm. or something else. Um, just different learning styles, different learning um, or just ways of being that can also sort of hit on the same thing. But it's really cool. It sounds like you created some really positive social capital and interactions. Well, that was the intent. <laughs> Check. <laughs> Thank you. We talked about in our group, well, one of the people mentioned that um, getting the kids into the habit. And I thought that that was a really key word there because if you start getting into the habit of being grateful, then it'll be easier to journal about being grateful. It'll be easier about, you know, working it into all areas and just creating that habit. She said that she would have her kids line up at the end of the day and maybe, you know, a few of them could say what they were grateful for from the day and start creating that habit. I really liked that idea of creating the habit of gratefulness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a micro, a little micro moment or a little micro lesson built into what you're doing. It doesn't have to be an hour long like this. It can be boom, quick. What's your takeaway? What's your exit ticket for today is what you're grateful for. What's been a win, something like that. Yeah. But as we said, habits and change can be hard. It does, it does take conscious, active practice. And with that, James, I also wonder knowing that everybody in this room wears so many different hats and has so much going on. Um, how does that, you know, when you're like going back and forth and running up and down and have so much going on, how do you make that space for, do you have any tips for that? Yeah. Uh, you mean other duties as assigned is a large part of our job function? What? No. Um, yeah, no, I, and I've been there and I, I resonate and empathize with that feeling as if there's so many different hats, so many different things to accomplish. Um, First and foremost, I do, I do think it takes a moment just to, to be mindful, just to take a deep breath uh, and to center yourself. Um, that can go a long way. Um, I think if you can create it into sort of your routine, that can be helpful. And then it, you're the expert of your own experience. You know what works for you. You know what doesn't. So take all these things as I, I like to call these as like door openers to a conversation uh, about what works for you. Your own well-being is going to look very different than mine. Then it's going to look for the person on your Zoom box to the right of you. Um, so I, I think first and foremost, it's building self-awareness of what works and what doesn't work for you um, and trying to uh, incorporate that as much as you can. Anyone have thoughts about that piece? Any, anything you want to say about being busy and trying to fit it all in? I love how Ben's saying more like entire job, other jobs as a sign. And I've seen some head shake. I think yeah. it just comes back to the habit idea that no matter what you're doing to make it small and achievable, if you're going to add it into your life. And I, I don't know the science on how long it takes something to become a habit, but is it 30 days or 90 days, you know, maybe having a goal of, of a month or two or three to try to do something really small and achievable. So it becomes fully incorporated. Yeah, the three, the three good things research, a lot of it has been three good things every day for three weeks. That's not an exact science, but that's sort of the intervention that they've put out there. Um, but again, I'm going to put on my coaching hat again, and I'd ask, I would pose it to all of you and ask yourself, you've incorporated and made certain things habits in your life already. What made those things successful? What were they? What maybe got in the way? Like you've navigated this challenge of incorporating something into your life that's going to add value to yourself. It could be professionally, it can be personally but you've made something a habit, I would assume, again, big assumption, but I'm assuming you've probably incorporated something in your life thus far. Uh, that's now a habit, just second nature. Um, what made it so? And, and can you maybe replicate or learn something from that experience that you can maybe use gratitude if that's the piece you want to incorporate uh, in, as a new habit? I like to think of it like we're driving. Like when I first was driving, like I'm very aware that I'm like, not sure what I'm doing. I like got to make sure everything's good. And now I can drive to the grocery store without even thinking about it. It's so conscious, um, unconscious that I just kind of do it. 
uh, same, similar with some of your habits uh, that you probably already do. And there's probably lessons to be learned from that experience that you can maybe apply here for either for gratitude or any of the other well-being practices you're talking about. There's another question. Um, so last week we had a conversation around resilience and healing, and I'm, I'm curious um, how gratitude may relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Again, it's a, it can be a tool. It can be a tool to, to take out as a toolkit. I think that last study that I talked about where um, they've done, you know, they talked about gratitude. Can it be, can it happen even when you need to bounce back or when there's been something negative that's happened to you? Uh, and, that, and they've shown that, they, that it can, it can really kind of help close the, the book on sort of these, what they call open memories or these intrusive memories that are maybe getting in the way that this mindset, this mindset shift to the positive allows us again, to be a lot more generative. It fires off, you know, I, I want to get into the neuroscience of it all, but I know it fires off different centers of our brain in a ways that allow us to be more creative, more adaptive. Uh, and then I think hence resilient. So that study in particular, I think points to that more so, but it's not, it's not the silver bullet, right? There's a lot of different strategies and tools um, that can help us bounce back and bounce forward. Thank you. I see a lot of heads nodding. I think that folks really relate to that. Yeah. Um, well, sadly, we have potentially time for one more question. Anybody have any thoughts? Something that's really burning inside you want to share with James and all of us? I will say uh, there's just a nice serendipity here that we, you know, this Echo series goes for another uh, about three more weeks. Um, and so we've got we've got three weeks together. So maybe we could... Um, offer up a, a new a new practice on gratitude um for that for that length of time i myself want to try it so you all can uh you can join me and we can check in on our gratitude practice um and i think one of the things in that research james correct me if i'm wrong is is that it changed the way that people start to look and scan because you part of it is, i think is that you have to name new things you can't be grateful for the same three things every day correct. so if you go for it for 21 days, you have to really start to look and that can change your kind of habit of mind of just always being grateful. Right. I think it, it challenges that natural scanning of what's the threat to what's the good. Um, so you're right there. Yeah. The research is really looking at three new things each day. So I'm grateful that, you know, my son, daughter, whoever gave me this art behind me the next day, I'm grateful that, you know, my plant is really thriving behind me, whatever it is, but try to think of new things. And then your brain starts to scan and at least it doesn't flip the scale says that it's just rainbows and unicorns. It just tries to balance the scale of the negative to positive that we probably are actually experiencing because our brain naturally does this. It tips the scale towards the negative immediately. And all this does is try to balance the scale that allows us to do something with it. Nice. And there's a, there are some, I know different people, different strategies there, are, you, know, you can do it on a journal. You can, um, there's apps. I'm blanking on them off the top of my head right now that kind of prompt you three times per day to do it. So um, some of that, could, could, if you do some simple searches, I think could find it. Um, forgive me, I'm just blanking right now of what they're called, but um, there's a lot of different ways to hopefully, if you want to do this challenge, I'm hearing this as an informal challenge from Ben um, to do this for the next three weeks as you wrap up this series. So just to clarify the challenges starting today, three things, write them down that we're grateful for. Do it every day. We're going to try if you want to take the challenge. Open inv- yeah, open invite. And it has to be something different every day. Those three things. Is that yeah. am I getting it right? Yeah. We'll also okay. throw a prize in, uh, a drawing. Wow. There'll be a drawing for a prize. Wow. Okay. For those I who can add one little thing it. to make sure it's you, you include the why, like why or the because I think that's what makes it go a little okay, deeper than like, you. I'm grateful for my plant or I'm grateful for my family. It's, it's the why that connects more okay. to sort of your emotions and it brings up the memories, which makes it cement in your brain a little bit harder. Nice. Great. Thank you for clarifying. Cause I've never done this challenge. So. I'll throw off for everybody. We have a track record of good prizes. I was going to say, we do have great prizes with crush. So yeah, that's a great challenge. Thank you so much. Uh, And James, thank you so much for being with us today. We, everybody is smiling and it feels like the energy in the room really is um, uplifted. Is that, 
you know what I mean. You got it. <laughs> Thank you so much. For more information about Project ECHO and upcoming ECHOs with the University of Denver, please visit mortgage.du.edu forward slash ECHO or follow us on Twitter at ECHO underscore DU underscore MCE. Thanks for watching.